Well, welcome everybody. I'm Nick Williams, I'm Vice President, still standing in for David Zerman, our President, who's recovering well from his left hip replacement, but still not able to be in here yet. So we hope we'll be back in a few weeks. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri to the north and the Bunurong to our south, and pay our respects to their elders past and present, and to any traditional owners and indigenous people who are joining us tonight. And we send a warm welcome to everyone. Now this special presentation tonight sounds very exciting, the future of electronics from a panel of scientists closely concerned with limiting the ever-expanding amount of energy we're consuming from our rapidly growing technology sector. Now tonight we have a very special panel from the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in Future Low Energy Electronic Technologies, FLEET, you've got to have an acronym. Associate Professor Mira Parrish, Dr. Carlos Kuhn, Mrs. Rebecca Oral Trigg, have joined us to discuss the future of electronics beyond the end of Moore's Law. I talked to Errol a bit before and he's not sure that everyone knows what Moore's Law is, but I assured him we're all fairly technologically literate, but I'm sure he'll, he'll uh, tell us all about it anyway. And Errol's going to take over as uh, chair for the rest of this. Thank you, Errol. <laughs> Errol's the senior communications coordinator with Fleet and he's passionate about creating good content, whether it's science, energy, the environment, Pacific culture or New Zealand history. He's a physicist slash editor slash storyteller. So this should be good. Uh, thanks, Nicola, for the introduction. And thank you to the Royal Society of Victoria for allowing us to come along and talk to you about the future of computing and electronics. These talks here at the RSV cover all sorts of really cool science, science that's done in Victoria or that's relevant to Victoria or, or wider issues. Um, and as Nicola said, just this month there's been forestry and astrobiology and the science of footy, um, which are all pretty cool. Um, we're really stoked to be adding a bit of a dose of physics to this. Um, and thanks to everybody who's come along on a Thursday to, to listen to this. Getting science out into the public sphere is really important. We, um, we've, we've spent a lot of time on this at Fleet. Um, it's important that scientists don't work in isolation from the public, and in the case of taxpayer-funded science, it's important that the public knows what we're doing with their money. We also think it's really interesting. Uh, we're scientists because we're passionate about science, and we're hoping that if we explain our science and the reasons for it and the benefits from it, we can persuade others that it's interesting as well. So Carlos, Rebecca and Mira are going to talk to you about some of the background of uh, computing, uh, to put it into context, and about Moore's Law, which Nicola assures me you all know already, uh, and also um, sort of unpicking a major issue of uh, electronics that will unfold in the next decade or two and what this will mean for computing. Um, and finally, some relatively new fields of physics that should hold solutions to those issues. At the end, we'll have um, a long period for questions. So if you've got any questions during the three talks, please remember them until the end. We really, really want your questions because we're still fine-tuning some of our explanations. Um, so the first speaker will be Dr. Carlos Kuhn, who studies ultra-cold atomic gases at Swinburne Uni. Um, when I say ultra-cold, I mean really cold, about a millionth of the temperature of our space. Um, Carlos is also very passionate about science and education and inspiring school students, and I'm hoping we might get him to talk a bit more about that at the end during Q&A. Um, but uh, for the start, he's going to kick off our talks uh, by talking about some of the background to electronics. Over to you, Carlos. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you. I have like a very simple job. My job is the introduction, and everyone most already know what computer is, and we use a lot of computing, computation power, correct? Uh, who's in the audience do not have a smartphone? <laughs> Whoa. But you know, I noticed as well 
there are people with more than one, one smartphone. And when I'm going to do work in the train, people like, if you choose a smartphone, and they are playing, I think, Pokemon or something, or another games with one, doing another thing with another one, then all those things has a lot of power consumption. And most of those activities go to a cloud, a server somewhere in the clouds, like my daughter likes to say, like in the clouds. I don't know what this cloud is. Yeah, but the crazy is, it's already taking like about 80% of the energy in the road. That's a lot. And all that information we need to process. And to be able to process that information, we need what they like to call the building blocks of that, uh, the computation. And that is a transistor. Who knows what is a transistor? Okay, the most of people know what a transistor. And that's good. But they're gonna have to cover a tiny bit for the ones who do not know, and maybe in a different way what makes him think is interesting. Because if you go to in Wikipedia, you're gonna ask what is a transistor, and then the transistor you're gonna tell you is a semiconductor device used to switch, switch on or off, or to amplify an electronic signal. But let's break this in tiny bit like in, in a small concept to be able to understand that. What is that semiconductor device? It's an element used called silicon. And for that, I'm gonna need like six volunteers. Yeah, six. Yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah, you can come up. Arrow as well, please. I need like six volunteers and more. You can come in, can come in the front, please. Okay, hello, yeah, good. Uh, six, okay, yeah, good. <laughs> okay, those brave people, I have five, okay, good. Rebecca, can you go up? Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, that's very gender balance, that's very good. Uh, those people, I like to say they are atoms, okay? Yeah, then I need you guys to do this. Look at the hands, good. And that is an electron, okay? Then they have another electron. Uh, let's keep the same color. I don't know, I don't have it's all the same colors. Okay, and this for you as well. Okay. Yeah, hold that, hold that, hold that, hold that, hold that. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you so much, okay? They are very clever, they already like become like in a chain. Okay, that's very good because, no, no, okay, I can work with that. Okay, they are bound, yeah, because that kind here, that bound here is what we call the covalent bound, right? Then, that you can see uh, there is no free electrons to move. That's not a very good conductor then. The electrons, it is not gonna go ahead. Then what you're gonna do is, I need to do doping. Don't worry, it's not the doping in sports. That is legal, okay? That is a legal doping. What they're gonna do if like, I'm gonna separate the thing, that chain, in like in two parts, okay? In that part, they're gonna get that atom in the middle, and they're gonna say now, that atom, I'm gonna change, it's not gonna be a silicon atom anymore, it's another element, with an extra hand. She don't have another, another hand, sorry. Then let's pretend she has another hand, and then that another hand has like an extra electron in it, okay? Then that part here, now, that part here, has like a negative charge, then is any type doping, correct? And now in that part here, I'm gonna do the guy like here, I'm gonna, he's gonna lose the electron, okay? They're gonna have like now a vacance. No, you can keep there, yeah, because yeah, because I'm gonna need now that part here we call a p-doping, correct? Because it's positive charge now. He has more protons in the middle, okay? Then what happens is now there is like a preference movement. These guys can go like from this to this, and then this can go to this, this can go to this, and yeah, and it's, then you can see there is a direction that current can go through. And what you just build here is what you call the diode. Okay, but I want to explain the transistor. Yes, then I'm gonna do this again with more six people. No, just kidding. <laughs> First, I'm gonna just ask you, everyone to clap your hands because they are very brilliant. <laughs> okay. 
I kind of prefer that one here, but it's okay. Let's go. What are you going to do then now with two diodes? I'm going to put one to back to another one. And then, using different voltage, I can change when I can have current go into one direction or not current go. Okay? Then, it's not going to detail. You're going to need two different voltage, the threshold. But the idea is now, I'm going to have like that device to switch on and off. Zero or one. Zero, one, on, off, true, false. And yeah, that is the binary system. That's what's behind the computation. Okay? Then that on, off is the small information you can imagine in a wire. Right? This is on or off. Then that is our transistor. Then all the computation, all the information you're going to use is will be based on that, in on or off, in the binary. Then if I want to write the number 10, I'm going to need 0, 1, just in two powers of numbers, like 1, 1, 1, or 0, 0, 0, 0. Then you can see more complicated get the information, more bits I'm going to need. Because that thing, small information we call is a bit. Okay? Then you, you all heard like 8 bits is like a byte, and all those things going on, on and on. Then what is that? I need more information. I need more of those transistors. And then 1965, Gordon Moore, the Moore's law, predicted what that is a law. They said it's a law. Is that the number of the, those transistors in a microchip, you're going to double every two years. And then that reminds me the the chessboard, oh, the chessboard is already open. I will open the box, but it's okay. That reminds me a legend of the chess, one of those. It's a very old game. I don't know if you, someone already heard about that legend. It is uh, Sisa Dahir, an Indian mathematician, creates the game for an Indian king. I take the legend for the, mo the, book, uh, the, kings, the book of the kings. Okay? Then he creates the game and gives it to that king, and the king gets like, very, wow, that's a very nice game. He put like in all the Hindu temples the, the game to play, and he come to Sassin and said, okay, that is the best game ever. I want to give you a prize. Give me what your reward. What do you want for that? What's the prize? Then Sassin is a very clever mathematician. He said, okay, I have like eight, eight, and then he said, I want one gram of rice in the first, two in the second, and four, and go on, in powers of two. Like the same as like our Moore's law, powers of two growth. The king just think, ah, okay, that is easy. Huh? It's just increased like that. I, okay, I'm going to give you that rice. But when he realized the amount of rice is like three, 300 years of the rice production in the world, it's like, it's impossible he give that rice. Some versions I learned, the first one, he lost the palace because he could not grant the wish. But we, from that, means, that, that history, that legend, not history, not real, um, we have to take that lesson for us as well. Like our phone is getting very, very small because we need that growing, the transitions. Nowadays, Intel produce like 14 nanometer across the size of the transistor. Okay? And inside of that phone, we do have 4.3 billion transistors just in the microchip of that guy. Then I think Haro, Haro, oh sorry, I almost break. Okay. Uh, here is like, like a very old technology. <laughs> and I need to put like here. 4.3 billion of that thing inside of this. I don't think fits, correct? <laughs> good, good, the, the technology is growing very, very, in the powers of two, increase. But we are reaching that limit. We cannot go much, much more than that. And I don't know if you know the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Uh, I watched with my daughter that movie. Yeah, you should watch, it's very funny. Uh, then, I cannot use that machine. The scientists build a machine who make everything smaller. 
and I cannot use that machine to make even smaller what's already happened, then that's why I'm gonna need like to new technology, new ways to solve that problem. And I'm gonna have to pass for people who are smarter than me to talk about that. Okay? <laughs> then thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Carlos. Um, that demonstration of electrons passing through atoms, Carlos developed that with his um, undergrads this week, which sounds like a magnificent use of their time. Thanks <laughs> to Carlos's undergrads. <laughs> um, so next up is um, Rebecca oral Trick, who's a PhD student. It's recently transferred to UNSW from RMIT. Um, Rebecca uses metals that are liquid at room temperature to synthesize um, what are sometimes called two-dimensional materials, so materials that can be as few as, as thin as just a few atoms in thickness. And you can use these, um, these materials for all sorts of applications, including future electronic devices. Um, if you want to ask Rebecca about that research, please wait till the end. At the moment, she's going to talk about computing, picking up from Carlos's talk. Over to you, Rebecca. So as Carlos described, the prediction of Moore's law means that transistors are getting ever smaller to the point where they're just billionths of a millimetre now. Uh, but while we've been forecasting the end of Moore's law for decades, uh, we are reaching the physical limits of how small we can get if they're just 14 nanometres across. What happens, though, when we do get as small as we can get? Well, when this happens, we will have actually reached the end of one interpretation of Moore's law, and we'll need to find new ways of expanding our computing power if we ever hope to keep pace with our current level of technological advancement. But what about another aspect of technology and computing that we don't really think about, just the amount of power that it uses? And that's effect on climate change. As Carlos said, approximately 8% of the entire energy output of the planet goes towards powering computers and, and communication technology. And that amount is doubling every decade. To put this in perspective, ICT has the same impact on climate change as the worldwide aviation industry. And we're already aware that that's having detrimental effects on our environment. And this has several impacts. First, of course, being the effects of climate change itself. Globally, we need to find ways of curbing our environmental impact, and our communications technology is really no different. We tend not to think about it as we're always more obsessed with what it can afford us and the great technology that allowed us as a nation to order 83 million chicken nuggets on Uber Eats last year. <laughs> Real number. <laughs> and low energy technology is a possible way for us to do that moving forward into the future. Uh, the second impact uh, is the possibility of an energy crunch, uh, which is where the, it's the amount of energy and not the size of the transistor that becomes the limiting factor in advancing our technology. Uh, this means our user end technology will stop advancing, our data storage, our cloud storage, our networks will stall, um, and really nothing will advance at all possibly. There are over 2 billion computers in the world and 2.5 billion smartphones. About 40% of the planet has one. It, to put that in perspective, in 1953, there are about 100 computers worldwide of any technological description. So both the amount of computing, as Carlos has described, that each individual machine does, and just the sheer number of computers in the world has increased exponentially in you know, 60 years. Additionally, we're adding computers into ever like, increasing aspects of our lives, from smart fridges to air conditioning to electronic cat litter trays. It's, it's pretty much everywhere now. And it's increasingly dominating our lives. It's easy to see how that energy consumption is doubling every decade. And we really maybe only have a decade or two left with our current energy production targets uh, to actually meet that. And so we're going to have to invent uh, both new forms of energy production and just new ways of dealing with it. And thirdly, we're all pretty familiar with a phone or a laptop getting a bit too hot or possibly a, fl a flight risk. Uh, and this is because much of the energy stored in the battery doesn't actually go towards running the smartphone. It's dissipated as heat. Uh, the iPhone 8 has 4.3 billion transistors in the microchip but only about a third of those are ever actually firing at any one time because the rest of them just need to cool down so that they can get bit, uh, be used. So dissipation of heat is already a limitation on our computational power, something that we're already dealing with. 
And so just, just not even the size, but the technology itself and the materials need to be changed so that they could be more efficient at dissipating this heat. Uh, to this end, Google has actually been experimenting with putting data centers in the sea, so off the coast of Scotland and California, so they can be fully submerged and um, cool down much more quickly. And yes, it's Google, but even that's no easy feat. And it just goes to show really how much a, real, a physical limitation of our world, just heat generation and dissipation, how much of an impact that has on our lives and on our advancement as a species. So we may need to invent new ways of storing our data storage in order to meet the physical demands that we place on it and our own, on, on our own lives. So for all these reasons, creating materials that are more energy efficient in terms of heat dissipation is a vital step, not just in creating the next wave of technology, but just taking advantage of what we already have. And the trade-off for being connected to the digital world and the internet of things is the exorbitant amount of power necessary for that connection. And we aren't meeting the demands for its future as such. So we need scientists and engineers to create new materials for the, this continuing age of advancement. So low energy electronics, so what we do at Fleet, is a really promising frontier uh, for this, so that we can, in a sense, kind of reinvigorate Moore's law. You know, maybe it doesn't need to come to an end. Maybe we don't get make transistors that are any smaller, but we change the materials and can continue on doubling the power every every two years. But even the fact that we have Moore's law at all really is a testament to humanity's ingenuity and resourcefulness. You think about it, computers have changed our lives and the human condition so much, more than virtually any other advancement in human history, and allowed us to interact with our planet and the universe in, a way, in ways that a thousand years ago would have been perceived as magic. You know, Moore's law, as we know it, may be ending, but that doesn't mean our advancement has to end at all. So as scientists, we're navigating these problems of energy consumption and heat dissipation, and to create materials for this new world. And unfortunately, I'm not a physicist, so I'll hand over to Mira uh, so she can better explain the actual science of how and why we're going into this new frontier. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker is Associate Professor Mira Parrish. Mira is a theoretical physicist at Monash Uni, where she investigates fundamental behaviour of quantum particles and how they organise themselves into exotic states of matter, such as superfluids and superconductors. She leads the theoretical quantum matter group at Monash's School of Physics and Astronomy, and she's also a chief investigator within Fleet, which means she leads one of the centre's 20 research streams. Thank you, Mira. Um, yeah, so thanks, Errol. Um, I thought I'd try and unpack first a little bit about why it is that computers generate so much heat. Why is it that they waste so much energy? And the issue really is, is, is comes down back to what Carlos was initially talking about. We need to um, move electrons around in order to perform computations. So we need to have electrical currents in order to actually be able to you know, you know, flip those zeros and ones and actually be able to compute whatever we, whatever we want to compute. And that, the problem with that is that, as, as, we, as probably many of you have noticed, if, if you've ever had an electric shock, that electrons don't always do what we want them to do. And, um, and indeed, in, in this case, if I, okay, here, here's a schematic um, diagram of a conventional transistor, so where we're trying to um, take an electron, say, from one side to the other, and they don't, they tend not to go smoothly to one, one's nice, nice and smooth. They tend to you know, hit a hit obstacles along the way. And, in, and the issue is there is that as soon as it hits an obstacle or a defect, it, it loses its energy. And, and that energy is basically lost as heat. So that's, that's essentially a sort of a sort of simple picture of what's, why we're actually losing a lot of our energy in these, in these uh, computers. And, and indeed, um, Current computers certainly, okay, com computations always will come with some energy cost, but this processes like these means that we're m very, very far away, many orders of magnitude far away, in fact, from realizing an, um, a, the, you know, the perfectly efficient computer that the laws of physics would allow. And so that gives us um, sort of possibilities to explore new ways in which one can 
I've realized um, um, different, different materials, different computers. And indeed, at, here at Fleet, what we're going to be uh, looking at is how to um, come up with new uh, materials and new, new sort of devices where we kind of solve this problem, of, you know, where, where we want to actually have electrons flow without losing this, this energy. And let me, let me unpack, there really are um, three, I would say, elements to the new physics that we're going to explore in this center. And one of them is, is firstly, we have new, new types of materials that are one atom, essentially one atom thick. Okay, here's an example. Um, so, so you might have, you, perhaps many of you might have already heard about um, graphene, which was a, a basically graphite, which was a single carbon atom thick, first um, discovered um, back in the mid 2000s, uh, 2000s, and which led to the very recent Nobel Prize in 2010. But basically, what I'm, what I'm, what we're seeing now is we're going actually beyond this just just this single type of material, graphene. We're actually going to, um, we're actually entering a whole new realm of different, different um, two-dimensional or atomically thin materials where you can have new, you know, different architectures, different structures. You can even stack them on top of each other. You have a lot of flexibility, a lot of control, and this in turn allows you to even look into different types of new, you know, electrical properties. So, so it's a very exciting time. And in, in principle, well, in, in particular, I should say, what, one of the things it's allowed us to do is, is realize a rather neat idea, which actually comes from mathematics. It's a branch of mathematics called topology. And um, really what, what this is, is that it's a, it's a way in which one can classify uh, objects or shapes. That's essentially what topology is. And to give you, give you an example, so if you take, you've possibly already seen this in various contexts, but if you take the example of a coffee cup versus a donut, the idea is that actually these belong to the same type of object because you can deform, or you know, if you're thinking of them as like clay, you can squish and deform one into the other without actually doing anything very violent, without actually pulling it apart or anything like that. So that, in, in, in a topologist's mind, that's, that's essentially the same object. Whereas, for instance, if you took, say, something like a, a ball or, you know, or, I don't know, this vein or something, um, that would be a different type of object because you would need to actually, well, I won't, I won't try not to do that to the vein, but you need to actually put a hole through it to actually make it look like this donut. Okay, so that sounds so very nice, but what's very surprising, actually, what's remarkable is that the same types of classifications can be applied to the electrical pr properties of materials. So we can use the same kind of ideas as like this to um, classify uh, materials. And what this means in particular from, um, which is important from Fleet's point of view, is for instance now if I, if I took some material, um, say like a, a material that didn't conduct, like a, an insulator, didn't conduct any electrical current, and it, but it was of a different topology uh, class from say the air around it. You know, so it's different, different type of class. What this, this already, essentially constrains what the electrical current can do in such, in, and it turns out what, what you find is you have to have a flow of current around, around the edges of this, of this material, just because the, the class it's, it's, it's fit, it sits in is different from its surrounding, from the surrounding area. So, so, and what that means then is actually you've now set up a system where you, you're forcing current you've, to flow smoothly or you know, constraining it to flow smoothly without losing energy, which is exactly what, what we're after. And you can really think of it, um, if you like, well, this is, I, I was meant to have a prop of chocolate, but okay, you can think of it as, as chocolate wrapped in foil, if you like. You have a, just a nice insulator, uh, sort of nice conducting layer around, around the, side, uh, the edges of this, this, this um, non-trivial kind of material. And these, these ideas were, were so important that they, I mean, actually, they were, they were, I'm happy to say, in, um, they, were, they were invented by theorists. <laughs> um, so, and three theorists, um, got, uh, theoretical physicists, got the, the Nobel Prize um, just recently in 2016. Um, so Duncan Haldane, um, um, David Thales, and, uh, and, and, and Michael Kostelitz. And indeed, even, um, even now, uh, so I've, Duncan Haldane is, is, is very much active, coming up with very interesting ideas. And, and, and I was, here's me with him at a recent conference talking very serious physics. <laughs> so um, yeah, so 
So it's, it's, very, it's very, very interesting stuff. So, that, so that's one, one idea that we're exploring, but there is another one that we can think about. So, okay, so when we're using the idea, of, so so far we've had the idea of mathematics, topology, constraining the, the current or allowing us to control the current. Another possibility is, what about if we can get the electrons to organize themselves in a way so that they can flow in a very ordered manner, okay? And um, one, one example of, of such a thing that's very organ, organized, very ordered, very coherent, is, is light. We can, and well, this is, a, this is why I wanted the laser. This is a particularly good example that we have in our everyday life. The laser, which is a very, basically very organized, coherent light. Um, and so, the, so one question then is, well, can we actually imbue the electrons with this same kind of organized character? And one, one option is, actually, amazingly enough, you can actually engineer a, a setup where you have uh, a mixture, essentially, of light and matter, or light and electrons. And the way you do that, and I have a little video here, is you, you take, for instance, your atomically thin material, and you put it in between to these two mirrors, okay, so that you allow light to bounce back and forth. All right, so here now you have this light bouncing back before the, b between the mirrors, and each time it, it hits this material, it excites an electron plus, plus this hole. Okay, and so and, and it gets absorbed and then re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted and then bounced back and forth. Okay, and so it keeps going. Okay, <laughs> until you okay, you get the general idea. <laughs> yep, right. Okay, um, and so then the idea is actually you can form this hybrid object, which is both of light and matter. You know, so both consisting of this 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 uh, this photon actually and this this um, this electron hole object here. Called the, and it's called a polariton. And so already it's been demonstrated that these polaritons can flow very, very orderly or organized um, without, without any energy loss. And so the hope then is that we can use this to actually allow electrons to flow also without dissipation, without heat, uh, energy loss. So I think, I think with that, um, I've, so, I've, so this is just the, the overall picture of some of the things we've been thinking about, but I'm happy to go into more details when, well, you'll help when we discuss and answer questions. Yeah. Okay. So if Carlos and Rebecca want to come up join us again. Thank you, Mira, yeah. for that. Um, so if anybody, I think we have a roaming microphone. Um, if anybody has any questions that um, they want to ask any of the three panel members um, about their research or about the overall issue, um, do you want to uh, maybe this chat here? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, everybody, for a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, uh, just, a, just a very quick question, um, Mira, for you. Um, how do the photons... Um, in your polaritons, well, where do they come from? How are they introduced, and how do they exist in that, in that sort of? Ah, okay. Um, yes. So, so typically, you will actually shine light onto the. Onto, it's basically it's, it's called a cavity, but basically you have this this uh, structure with with mirrors, and you actually have light shining in on it. And then, okay, the mirrors have still got a little bit of transparency, so you can allow some of the light to come in, but not so much that that they completely leak out so they can bounce around quite a lot of times first and then, and then form this, this uh, composite, this hybrid object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, following on from that, um, is it a visible light? Is it a particular spectrum that it works for or, or works Ooh. better with? Um, yeah, there are, yeah, there is a particular, okay, so basically you want it to be resonant with that transition this, this exciton transition, and I believe that was, ooh, I think that was around, I think that was, it was visible, I think, right? Roughly, or is it? I'm trying to think, so I'm the theorist, of course, so that's why I, I know, <laughs> I, think in, I think in like dimensionless, no, I, yes, I, I think, so. yes, yeah, so, but basically you, it, it also depends very much on the material, actually, so, um, so, so some will have, so, so, so you're trying to excite an electron across an energy gap, so it will very much depend on what that energy gap is. But I think I think so. In principle, there's a range of um, the frequencies. But yeah. 
Um, so uh, where do um, things like quantum computing and uh, high temperature superconductors fit into all of this? I mean, is everything going to become quantum um, computing or uh, is there more, much more to it than that? And that's, I think, to our physicists here. Oh, to, to me again? Did you want to have here? Um, okay. I can say something about the high temperature superconductor, but did you want to say? I just wanted to, yeah, so that's actually, there's a good question about the high temperature superconductors. So we deliberately uh, haven't mentioned anything about the, that in the center because one issue that I didn't really mention was um, is that is okay? We 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 know how to have uh, a flow of electrons without uh, resistance, and that's that's the superconductor. That's one example. The issue is getting that up to room temperature, and that's that's been a big challenge. And that's why we're exploring different options, like like for instance, topological insulators or these polaritons, where um, where you can actually where there is a chance that you can or a hope that you can actually get this nice dissipationless flow, or this flow without energy loss at room temperature. Um, about quantum computers, did you, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if, like the quantum computation is actually not like a very directly with the Moore's law, because we are going to still have to use our mm. normal computation mm. in our nowadays activity, correct? Um, and I honestly, I think it's kind of like a uh, fantasy we're going to have a quantum computer actually work. But <laughs> okay. yeah, it's a controversial. Yeah, <laughs> but as a, a, a experimentalist, I think it's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. As we are gonna need those like a topological material if you want to do be able to do the quantum computation. That's like what Microsoft is doing. Microsoft is using Majorana to try to create the quantum computation. When you're gonna use like topological states in the two edges. What's a different approach than EBM? EBM is already like a, using another approach to to be able to use like in uh, Microsoft nano wires with Majorana. EBM, do you know? EBM, I think, is topological. Yeah. EBM is topological material, and then um, Microsoft is using the not the topological material is those like edge states in not edge states, a Majorana effect. It's like a, a virtual. Virtual state, like in the two ends of the wires, but but like I said, like we still gonna need be able to produce like uh, something we can use in our day to drive the car because, the, like Rebecca said, the, the technology gonna drive in our car. Maybe the um, the quantum computation you're gonna be helpful to process new cryptographies like or break things faster, solve problems more fast, like helping the uh, uh, intelligence artificial, artificial intelligence. A Portuguese background, I was never get the what come from the G type of person. It's okay. Yeah, but then I think it's a tiny bit different, the association between the two things. Uh, well, this, this gentleman has stated my, uh, my <laughs> question. It was, what's the intersection between quantum computing and things like these exotic materials, whether they be um, topological insulators or excitons or polaritons. Um, I guess I didn't quite follow that explanation in full, so I'd be interested, Mira, mm -hmm. in, in your view of is, the, is there a possibility there that quantum computing might come out of these materials like topological insulators? Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, there is some other line of work which is trying to look at. Um, I think I think what Carlos was trying to talk about was um, this so-called topological quantum computing. I don't know if you've heard of this phrase before, but essentially, once again, um, so, so one issue with with quantum c computing, which okay, I'll just mention it. This is not our focus, but I'll just say it anyway. Um, is is the fact that um, well, you want to you need to have keep things quantum and and. And that, that's very hard to do, as in you, you're trying to keep things entangled, you're trying to keep things um, coherent, and something, or you're trying to make sure that, that you don't have the classical world interfering with your, with your nice quantum setup, <laughs> essentially. And, and so that's quite tricky to do, and what, so that's why people are exploring how, people could, how topology could be used to fix that issue, make that more robust. And so that's one uh, line of research that people have been looking at and using this kind of the con ideas of topology. Um, from our context, I guess we're, we won't be, we're, we're really talking at conventional computing and such, but trying to um, 
trying to make, which, which I think will always play a role in, in, in society. I mean, quantum computing is nice, but you'll always need to have conventional computers as well. Um, and you, so, so we're just trying to make, we're trying to look at ways in which we can use the similar, some, some of the same ideas, but to make things more energy efficient. Um, we actually, yeah. um, I don't, people might not realise, but Australia actually has four quantum science yes. centres of excellence, so the same type of organisation yeah. as Fleet, so Fleet's one of them. The work that these guys do is, is quantum, but not quantum computing, just to make it confusing. Yeah, confusing. Um, <laughs> there's also the Quantum Science Centre and Quantum Technologies and the Exiton Centre. So all of those are working on quantum stuff. Australia's actually really strong on quantum science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you all for, for an interesting discussion. Mira, you described a single cavity mm -hmm. for a uh, polariton cavity. Mm -hmm. In order to have a computer, you have to have many of those, and yep. they have to be linked and interrogated. Where are we in the process of, of doing that? Ooh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, honestly, we, we are a long way away from that in this system at the moment. I think what we would like to do, I mean, okay, so the one other thing I didn't mention was, was the case where you just had excitons without the light. The, the reason I mentioned the uh, the reason I mentioned the polariton case is we already have a, essentially a demonstration that you can have this coherence, this, uh, this, this flow at room temperature, which is, so that's, that's the, the really nice thing about having the light there. Um, but I, I, I admit that I, I at the moment, I, I, mm, I think it would take probably a bit of time to work out how to scale it up with the light. It might be easier to do it without the light, not have the cavity, but just have essentially the, the excitons themselves forming the, 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 bit, the transistors, is that, yeah. Errol, yep. I'll just ask a quick one, yep, uh, yep. hopefully it's a quick one. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of the, um, the range of expertise that we have here, actually. Uh, uh, yes, so yes. we've got a theoretical, theoretical yes. physicist here. Yep. Um, Carlos, what, how would you describe your field? Uh, an experimentalist. Experimental? Yeah, in cold atoms. In what, sorry? Cold atoms. Cold atoms. Yes, I make atoms very cold. Thank okay. You for <laughs> <laughs> by shining laser, what yeah. okay. can be something weird to think, because laser is something hot. Yes, okay. Uh, before I get to you, Rebecca, Mira, how would you elaborate on your work? How would I elaborate? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so being a theorist, I guess I worked on a variety of different systems, so, so I've also actually worked on some of the, the, the type of exper these cold atom systems that Carlos does experiments on. Yes. But, I've also, but I'm also working on, yeah, the exciton polariton systems, and, and, and generally I'm, I'm, I'm working on systems where I'm trying to understand the collective behaviour of quantum particles. Wow. Yeah. And Rebecca, you gave us yeah. a, a terrific sort of uh, synth a, 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 yeah. a wrap up of the problem. I think um, I didn't get a great sense of your work. Oh, uh, I'm, yeah. I am a chemist, so the other end of basically we're in a, we're in uh, descending order of, of specificity. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. um, yes. oh, it's it's the material. There's science. a mathematician over there. Be careful. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, it's the material science, really. So yeah. people like Mira do basically tell us what um, they think the possibilities are and then we have to make them. Okay, so, so you put it into practice? Yes. So, wow. Yeah, they do the hard work. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Where are we going? Uh, stand here. Mm. Thank you. Um, I heard a very interesting talk the other day about all of the things a bee could do. It can recognise shapes and colours and it can navigate and it can learn and forget and it understands the concept of zero. <coughs> And the bee's brain weighs about a milligram, and the bee runs all day on a drop of nectar. So I'm just wondering: is the future, <laughs> is the future of computing actually understanding the bio biological evolution of a computer rather than just mm -hmm. material sciences? Wow. Mm. Okay. Who, who wants that one? I, I, I kind of like <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> Um, okay, is the, practically, if you understand correct, the question is the computer you're going to evolve by itself. It's more or less like that. And I, I don't, personally, I don't believe so. A computer just the, again, very complicated algorithms, what the, they can pretend they think. But if it's not a human who programmed that, what is even clever than the computer, they do not do how to do that thing. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think the computers are going to take the road in like that case. Well, 
I'm actually wondering if in, in this case whether it's a question of software rather than hardware. Yeah. So, because um, I know I've heard of um, a situation, I've heard of science where they they actually took some of what was going on in the bee's brain, as far as I understood, some of the algorithms, and and then used it in a helicopter. And so, and made it with, so the helicopter was able to fly around obstacles and stuff. So that so it could be, yeah. I mean, so I mean, but you're absolutely right that much of the issues could are also about solving some of the way we do software as well as hardware. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's more software. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's like the algorithm yeah. of the coding. Like. Yeah. That's like that's why the man can be beat by the computer in the chess game. Like yeah, I love chess. Look like, uh, <laughs> but it's not because the computer is clever than me. The computer not think by itself. But it has just a very good algorithm, and with the speed of the technology we have, they can think faster, like search for that faster than us can search for the possibilities. Mm -hmm. It's good to maths. Yeah, again, thanks for the great presentation. Um, Carlos, you showed a picture, or sorry, you held up a valve, and then you tried to fit, how was it, two billion or so, four billion valves? 4.3 billion. Inside the smartphone? Yeah. And there are two billion smartphones. So that's approximately you know, a tenth of the power of 18 billion transistors in the world. Are you working or collaborating with any of the silicon wafer producers to actually scale these theories and these technologies into a practical use? Because at the end of the day, these things have to be fabricated and our demand is going up. As Rebecca, you said, we're consuming more and more of these transistors and of these microchips mm -hmm. every year. How sort of far are we getting into the actual practical applications of these things? I think that might be more of a question for me, actually, yeah. rather than... Because <laughs> she's the one who is building those things. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, it really depends on the class of materials. So there's a lot of things like that we make in our lab. Um, we're focusing a lot on metal oxides, um, which are uh, some of which are semiconductors and are quite widely used in electronics. Um, and a lot of what we do is, or would be considered at this point, sort of first steps in that we're, we're still making them in the labs. But we are intentionally trying to make processes that are inherently scalable. Uh, so there's certain ones where that currently exist and have existed for a while where you might make a great material, but it'll be 50 micrometers wide. You know, it's not great. Um, and so that's in terms of what we're doing at Fleet, a lot of the time it's kind of hard to predict exactly where we'll be in 10, 15 years and then how we can take things to industry. But because that is the ultimate goal, we are intentionally making things that can go there and not not just doing you know things for the sake of it and hoping things. So, I mean, if all works out, hopefully soon we'll be collaborating, yeah. Just maybe here and then at the back. Um, so, we get the perfect topological transistor or uh, uh, polariton resist transistor. What's the payoff? How big is the device? How more efficient could it be? Do you want it to be? <laughs> Who'd like to? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's kind of one of the issues. Now we like is come back for the same case. What I I, I thought like a quantum computer is not going to be uh, a thing in my lifetime, I believe, but in the future maybe, because you can get like a red quantum computation, you can get those polarons in a machine in your lab, like in mine, but you have to be in the vacuum, and to be able to get like the vacuum, you need like a big chamber, and all those things are very big. And then it's not like a problem of physicists like me, it's like more a problem of engineering. <laughs> we prove like the concept is something exists, we can do it, now it just makes smaller. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, then that's why in the moment it's, everything is very large scale, like it's more like a fundamental research. And, but that's what drives the knowledge and like in the past the mobile was a big thing and now it's very small and the pen drive was a big thing and becomes smaller. But you prove the concept is possible. Like for example, I work with cold atoms and then my machine is bigger than that table. And to be able to trap your atoms like you that you cannot see by eye. But yeah, then that's you be like the challenge to make things this small at the moment. You know you want to complement something. This is still a way away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, oh no, I just wanted to mention that I think we, um, I think we still certainly have a few orders of, well, I'd be happy with an order of magnitude more efficient, possibly even more. I think that would already start to be 
of interest. I think I think the idea is we we want to explore new, um, well, as Carlos was saying, new materials, which even as a proof of principle, we can show they work more efficiently. Then we can give them to someone who can start to miniaturize it. Yeah, yeah. As Mira said, it's quite fundamental physics, and Fleet's yeah. still quite new. So we mm. only just launched last year, and mm. we have seven years of funding. At the end of that, hopefully, it's at the point where industry mm -hmm. goes all. Oh. Yeah, they're looking for new stuff, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's give them money. Yes, that we like yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, question for Rebecca. You mentioned that um, a third of a phone is only utilised at any one time because two thirds is too busy cooling down. Is there potential for materials to be evolved that would utilise 60% or 80% at any one time improving efficiency that way through better cooling or um, better utilisation of that rather than um, scaling to quantum technologies, I guess, but creating more efficient what we have already? Yeah, so that's really kind of one of the fundamental aims of what we're doing is finding things that are just, yeah, on the basic level more efficient as materials. Uh, because, yeah, you, you hear that statistic of like, oh, there's 4.3 billion transistors, but we only use a third of them. You go, well, what's the point of that, really? Um, so, yes, it is. it really is from our, our position in fleet, it's less about the, the quantum computing over there and more about focusing on what we currently have and saying, well, we know this is what we have, we know this is its limitation, and we also know that maybe these things could be more efficient or we could do something, something to them like turning the excitons into polaritons and make that more efficient. And then we can incorporate that into this, the things that we already know how to do, essentially, yes. So that would be... Um, really kind of the main focus of what we're doing, yes. So I guess the question to Rebecca, the, um, uh, we, we currently make uh, chips from silicon, and I think graphene was mentioned as a potential mm -hmm. replacement for silicon transistors. Is there any work going on to look at beyond silicon and carbon as basic blocks? Yes, yes. So there's a, a, an emerging industry known as Beyond CMOS, or Beyond, I think it's, um, what is it, um, carbon... I've forgotten the acronym now, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I shouldn't have mentioned this. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so it's beyond, moving beyond silicon, yeah. basically. Uh, one of the big uh, things that's of excitement there is, is germa um, germanium arsenide, I believe. Yeah. Gallium yeah. arsenide, yeah. yes, thank you. I think germanium is also being used in something. I've got that in my head for some reason. You're the um, chemistress. Um, yeah, so gallium arsenide. Uh, and so we've got a number of people in fleet working on that. Um, there's a, a team at, at UNSW uh, working specifically with gallium arsenide um, as the basis, really, of replacing silicon. Um, but in addition to replacing silicon itself, there's also a lot of other things inherent in the chip that we could replace, you know, or we could make smaller. You know, um, Mira talked about the idea of um, two-dimensional and atomically thin materials. So in some cases, it may not even be about changing the actual composition of the material or making it, you know, in sort of lengthways and width smaller. It could be just making it a single atom thick, and then its properties can be very different. So there's a whole yeah, there's a whole range of things that people are investigating, both in labs and uh, in sort of more company R and D things. Uh, I guess the question is probably for you also. <laughs> it seems the focus has been on information processing or computing. Mm. Just wondering, do you also look at uh, energy conversion, such as with new materials like perovskites that mm. are good apparently? for uh, low energy conversion mm. of solar energy, for instance, to electricity. Yes, as, uh, as good scientists, we're always looking for any other avenues that things can be used for. Uh, yes, so yes, energy generation and capture is one of them. Um, I don't know if anyone's working on that in particular in fleet. Errol, you would probably have a so. better idea than that. Not that I know of. Um, yeah, I can tell you that like in, in our lab, uh, say we've got a bunch of chemists and um, a lot of the materials that we make are intended to be used for electronics, but you know, a material very rarely has only one application. So there are lots of things that might be beneficial for gas sensing, say, and scaling it down to a single atom can be very, very beneficial in that as well. Or it's used for catalysis and water splitting or um, uh, as a waveguide and you know, in certain like optics and various things like that. So, um, yes, the computing is the main focus of fleet, but we, we try and uh, explore any avenue that something could be used for, really, yeah. So I guess one of the things that's common with fundamental research is that there's spin-offs on the way. So, for example, from um, 
Rebecca's group, there was a carbon capture mm. paper that came out a week or so ago, um, which is just entirely, you know, off course from what Fleet's doing, but incredibly exciting yeah. Um, yeah. potential applications. Um, and then at Monash, maybe about a month ago, there was a, a cancer biomarker sensor that came out of the 2D material work there. So there's, mm. there's always these kind of, you know, um, mm -hmm. serendipitous discoveries, I guess, when you're doing fundamental research. Mm -hmm. This is a comment, but I think there's a question in there somewhere. In the title, you look at CMOS technology as the end of uh, Moore's law. Mm -hmm. But when Gordon Moore enunciated his law in the mid-60s, CMOS technology wasn't around. Uh, in fact, it was a disruptive technology that allowed the, uh, Moore's law to continue past the um, regular silicon doping tr transistors. So m my question, or the comment leads to the question, is there a disruptive technology? And Carlos, I think that what you're doing is potentially very disruptive mm -hmm. because y you would be able to isolate a single atom and interrogating that would be a, a real breakthrough in, in Moore's Law. So I have a lot of faith in Moore's Law <laughs> because there always are disruptive technologies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there a question in there? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe just I'm to... trying to process. <laughs> Sorry, I need more yeah. transition oh. in my brain. <laughs> this is all over um, Isn't it one um, third? Uh, you try? Yeah, so, I, yeah, that's a very good point is that Moore's law itself is really just a, a description of the, in, the increase in computing power and we kind of then apply it to, oh, it's the number of transistors or, oh, it's the size of the transistor. And those things have held fairly well, but you're right, it's not the original law. So I suppose in a way, you know, we do talk about the end of Moore's law, which has been forecast for decades, but we really are hoping that it doesn't end in a way. I think we are hoping that there will be some disruptive technology. Uh, mm -hmm. And I suppose we hope that we're going to be one of the ones to find it, really. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the semiconductor, yeah. <laughs> industry, the semiconductor in industry actually breaks it down to what they call more, more, as in more, more. CMOS. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of new technologies like three-dimensional chips and things like that, which have the potential to, they say, extend Moore's law, but, you know, really we can redefine Moore's law to be what we want, so it doesn't matter. And then... There's that, there's more more, and there's beyond CMOS, which is, the, I guess, the disruptive technology, that when, you know, we, we stop just increasing slowly and we go back to what we used to do. And just in the comment of, like, a, I think you think, like, a, my work is, can be the next generation of a, uh, and then I want to just comment to that. I, I believe the fundamental research I am doing, you're gonna drive that technology, what you're gonna be able to do it, but that, question of the scaling, you'll be like the, the main issue in the moment. Right? Is, yeah, of course, it, it's already demonstrated you can use the cold atoms to, to be a bit, to become like that, that bit, like when you can store a photon, and then recover that photon back from the, from the cold atom system, the transition, you have like a, a very thick cloud of atoms and you shine light in and just take over that light later on, then you, you is, my research already has like the memory, we have like the bit, but as I said, it's bigger than that table to be able to generate that bit. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're gonna te tell us very good information and also for the future of the quantum computation as well. I think my research is gonna need some information because it can use the case of build as well. They can use like the probability and the two and the two states being correlated to each other. Zero one is not only zero one, but you have 50% of each one in the same process. But it's a tiny bit far yet. But yeah, thank you so much for the comment. <laughs> I think this question's for Rebecca. Yep. Um, just following on from your discussion about, or mention about germanium and gallium, not exactly dripping out of the rocks on Earth. If you're scaling some of this technology up for you know, widespread use, if you're taking into account the rarity or scarcity of some of the components you might be using, it might be available in the laboratory, but how available are they long term? 
That's a really good point, actually. Um, in terms of if we're, say, focusing on gallium, if we were to make everything out of gallium, you're, there wouldn't be nearly enough in the world for all of that. <sighs> kind of what I think about that is that in terms of the technology that we already have, we're already quite bad at, uh, at recycling it. You think of like cobalt is a very um, necessary element for smartphones. Gold is very necessary. Uh, and we just throw those away, you know, 2.5 billion and how many of them are going to go to landfill. Um, and so a lot, of, um, a lot of the experiments that we do are using quite rare uh, and um, uh, hard to find materials. Uh, but I think at least from a chemist and experimentalist point of view, we like to focus on the ones that are a bit easier to find or that are more easily recyclable. Um, so, you know, you can go for your, uh, your heavy and your rare earth elements that, you know, there'll be 20 atoms of on the entire planet, or you can go for something like an arsenide. And, you know, so it's, it really depends. But also um, another aspect to that is the scaling. So it, that's kind of the whole idea behind using what we term nanomaterials of if you need something that's only an atom thick, there's going to be a lot less of it in the initial product anyway compared to what we currently have. So there's lots of ways to mitigate. Yeah. Um, that might be, I think, our last question. Buy shares in gallium. <laughs> um, thank you again to RSV for uh, inviting us a lot, and thank you again to our three speakers. Um, this has been really valuable for us because we're still sort of working out the best ways to explain these concepts. So these questions are really good, and if you have more questions or feedback or advice, contact us at those places up there um, and, and tell us. Um, can we just have another round of applause for this? No, I was thinking by the time you need a lot more gallium, we might be mining the asteroids. <laughs> Very likely mm. by then. Hopefully one's made of gallium, yeah. That'd be yeah. <laughs> well, that, that was all rather mind-boggling, I thought. And Rebecca, I think, said 1953, there are about 100 computers. Roughly, yeah, difficult yeah. to get. Hard. Well, in 1953, I was at Campbell High, and a lot of people here were at school or uni or maybe just in their first jobs. And to think what's happened since then is just amazing. And I think we're incredibly lucky to have a group of young, dedicated scientists who are working at the coalface in this incredibly difficult stuff. And who knows what's going to come out of it. So I'd like to ask Kevin Orman Rossiter, who's one of our council members, to give the official throat of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And yes, I was listening. I heard that. Um, as a physicist who did work in gallium last night as a, as in my research days, I was actually always quite excited when something as exotic as ultra-low energy electronics, you can come to a talk and you can hear about polaritons, topological materials, two-dimensional electronics, cold atoms, and I did hear chocolate mentioned, which, um, which was very good. I always like a talk that can mention chocolate in there somewhere. But uh, um, I think this is a very interesting and an important area when we consider, as it was made obvious at the very start, that ICT does have the same effect on climate change as the aviation industry. I, for one, tomorrow I'm going to walk into the office and give up my second phone. And I hope all those of you who have got electronic cat litter trays just stop it right now. I mean, I just, I, my, my second phone is an indulgence, but that's just really, that's just way out of there. Um, I actually want, want to make one serious comment, though. Actually, I think this is a great example of what we're spending our public money on. So I'd like you to think about that as we come into election times. <laughs> that, that this is a great example of, of you know, publicly funded applied and pure research having an impact in our future and the future of the world. And if you just look at the list of uh, universities along the bottom there that are actually playing a role in this, this is fantastic idea of collaboration in Australia. So I would actually like to thank all of our presenters. Let me get, make sure I get all the names in the right order, and Rebecca and Carlos and Mira and our great MC for the night, Errol for such a great presentation and I would like to invite you all back in a few years time, because you've got seven years to work on this, so sweat at it guys, um, when you've got some of the interesting results or when 
you know, things get really exciting. Come back again and tell us all about it. So thank you very much for your time tonight.